Could a rainforest this degraded be coaxed back to life? A rainforest assessed by expert ecologists in the 1970s as effectively doomed to extinction? Clearly the answer is yes. But the path to success wasn't easy. It took a brave and dedicated team to break through the conventions of the day and find a way to harness the dying forest's intrinsic resilience. The story of rescuing wing and brush started in the late 1970s, when an interested local, Graham Allen, was inspired by the movement to regenerate weed-infested bushland that was gaining ground elsewhere in the state. The National Trust of New South Wales had begun offering contract services to local councils and other land managers using the Bradley method of bush regeneration. It was that sort of a program that Graham Allen had heard about and he thought, well, why can't we do something about this, this bombed out rainforest we have in town, the Wingham Brush? Maybe we can do something like that. Maybe they would know what to do or we could get something going here to get it cleaned up. And Graham was um, the first to bring or introduce the National Trust to the former Wingham Council. This was back in, uh, before 1980. And in 1980, the first regeneration team was formed with the National Trust, having an exclusive contract with the William Council, which then passed to the Great Atari City Council after amalgamation. Sorry. We're looking really at probably the, pretty close to the devastated heart of the brush that you've seen in the photograph. The famous photographs that were taken were taken, it is a little street off there, looking into a fig in there. So it, at this stage of the game, there was virtually, you know, you could look from here right across through the brush. Uh, there was kaikuya grass growing down at the bottom there, okay? That's how much light there was. So this was probably the worst, the worst of the brush, really right here. We had huge infestation of vines. Most everybody's seen the early photographs. Cat's claw and and redra. And redra is our biggest problem. So we started with a cat's claw because we didn't know what to do with the anredra. So, and once we got in the open areas, we found the anredra overwhelmed the cat's claw. No morning glory. Very little. Balloon vine. Mm -hmm. A lot of balloon, balloon vine. vine. We had yeah. big sections of balloon vine. I, I really wondered, I really wondered whether it could be done. I had no confidence at all that we would ever get there. And the fact that we did is, even today, I'm sort of a bit bewildered that we actually did get there. Wingham Brush is lowland subtropical rainforest, once widespread along Australia's east coast from Maryborough in Queensland to northern New South Wales. But only a tiny fraction of this ecological community now remains. And it was nationally listed as critically endangered in 2011. Australia's rainforests are survivors from a cooler, wetter and less fire-prone time. Over millennia, rainforest ecosystems retreated to more favourable locations, mainly east of the Divide, while sclerophyll vegetation, adapted to hot dry conditions and characterised by eucalypts, acacias, proteaceae, salt bushes and grasses, took over the rest of the continent. Rainforests were artificially pushed into further retreat in the last 200 years by clearing for agriculture, logging, weeds, and introduced animals. Aboriginal custodians were dispossessed. Australia's rainforests now consist of small isolated fragments, often in degraded condition. Looking at this, we thought, well, this is a start. We'll show, we'll show what weed removal can do. Okay, we'll show that it can be done. Other people will kick off and do it all over the place and they'll do it strategically. In our vision, we could see the whole manning cleaned up and we could see rainforests all along, this, all along the edges, okay, and, and, and all, all the riverine and drainage lines all cleaned up and wouldn't have been beautiful. But the high disturbance weed removal methods developed at Wing and Brush triggered a lot of controversy. They broke the minimal disturbance rules recently adopted by the National Trust that had been developed in sclerophyll ecosystems and less degraded areas. 
In the late 1970s and early 1980s, the minimal disturbance approach was embraced and celebrated as a revolutionary advance over destructive clean-up attempts like blanketed and repeated spraying and bulldozing that annihilated natives as well as weeds. The next step was to expand the method into a broader and more versatile situation-oriented approach and to better align it with the role of natural disturbance in ecosystem recovery. Match your approach to the resilience of the ecosystem and its level of degradation. And that revolution happened at Wingham Brush. So it was an ironclad five-year agreement and it was specifically to implement the Bradley Method at Wingham Brush. And I can still remember standing on the edge of this place and, and you know, you're looking at the Bradley method, start from the good and work to the bad. Now, where in the hell is the good? You know, where, it was just bad, the whole thing. I think the first real good sign for when we started to release those stumps and they were reshooting. That's it. Mm. And uh, those things that had the vines all over them yeah. and suddenly you let yeah. the sunlight in Ooh and suddenly there was a whole new perspective. So every step was look what's happening and innovate with what we're observing. And that's when the whole question about rainforest is different to the sclerophyll woodlands and forest down in the Sydney sandstone. We're on alluvium soils here. Things grow much faster. So John was observing with his team any little thing that was going on and they had to keep improvising the whole way to get this whole system up and running the way we kept it today. And we started what we consider to be the better areas were the areas where the cat's claw was. We could just cut stump technique, yep. okay? But then it didn't take us long to get into the areas that were covered in anredra. And that's where, you know, theoretically you could manually remove it. So at that stage, if you could remove a weed manually, that was the way it was done. It's only where it couldn't be removed manually that herbicide was allowed to be utilized. So it was still very much a manual technique uh, insisted upon at that time. We, we, we realized that there was no way we could save this brush except for getting these trees free of the vine shroud and doing it in a dynamic fashion. So we got kicking onto it and what we started to do is we started to use the herbicide in, in a wider manner than, uh, than was simply the cut it stump technique or spraying regrowth that was agreed upon. So instead of hand weeding the tratoscantia, we would spray it. Or, and we had, once we removed some of the anredra or the potato vine, we found we had 1,500 tuberlings per square meters, all of which could grow a meter a week if they had light. So we were applying spray to that regrowth. So it became a very dynamic thing where our first emphasis was not to wait for the ground to stabilize, in fact, we left the trad behind whilst we moved forward with the canopy until the canopy reformed. So when we first cut through these vines, the trees didn't have any leaves on them. Uh, the ground was exposed to bright light and sunshine. We had macphagina or cat's claw creeper seedlings coming up just in a complete carpet. And yet these are short-lived seeds. And we found by leaving the tratoscantia behind for a year or so, that they would perish under that blanket. By the time we removed it, we didn't have to contend with that wave of seedlings with the little tedious tubers to pick out. And we know about the anredra, we cut the vines off. They stayed alive in the trees, proliferated more tubers and rained down for years and years and years. And then we developed the scrape paint technique where we left the stems un unsevered. So a, a lot of the things that we did were more trial and error and also just being adaptive to whatever. So all these things were departures from the Bradley method, which was a complete block weed removal, section by section, to be stabilized on the ground before any advancement was done. And then we were sacked, the team was sacked in 1984. Um, uh, so we, uh, because of that departure from the Bradley, we weren't implementing the Bradley method. Really looking back on this, the, the big deviation was not the herbicides, which were really introduced to the team by Joan Bradley, Evelyn Hickey, and uh, Robin Buchanan, we mustn't forget, and Jenny Murray. Okay, those were really instrumental people in the early, early times. Um, so they, they brought in four herbicides for us to try. We played around with it and we found out the Roundup uh, herbicide, the glyphosate, worked. Uh, 
and again, Joan Bradley herself wrote us a letter of endorsing the, the fact that that's the way to go. As a chemist, she was able to give some interpretation from what the manufacturers were saying. I, I know when Alex and I came to do the assessment when the debacle or the battle of the brush was on with the National Trust, yeah, John wasn't doing the uh, Bradley method, but the report did support what was then sort of called the Stockard method. John wanted to call the wing and brush method, which is what it's known as today. Um, you've got Floyd at the top end of the rainforest experts, and you've got the National Trust, the iconic sort of uh, government or agency in Sydney, and uh, it was a real battle over things, particularly when this team got the sack. I mean, what was going to happen? But anyway, as I said, that, thank you, Michael, but is that cohesion of the team, the fact we continued on as volunteers for a year until I was able to uh, contract directly with the Greater Tauri City Council to keep this uh, program running. But that was said, we're a very dedicated team, very dedicated team. And without that, uh, th th there's no way we could have done it. Ultimately, the National Herbarium were brought in. There was a five-year assessment which supported what I call the wing and brush method of rainforest regeneration and the uh, way we're using herbicides, careful way, selective way in which we're using herbicides and the means by which we were approaching it, which was a canopy oriented approach, uh, not a ground centered approach. The National Trust and the wider bush regeneration industry soon came to understand and value this groundbreaking work. The evolution that John and the team contributed opened the door for regenerators to adapt approaches and techniques according to the needs of their particular ecosystem and site, while remaining constant to the key principle of releasing native regeneration potential. This boosted the efficiency and credibility of bush regeneration practice, and facilitated the restoration of a significant amount of biodiversity that would have otherwise been lost. In seven years we cleared all the vines from the canopy but we spent many years mopping up afterwards. So I think Peter Golan's here who did a lot of digging and he's done a lot because I've come back here as a volunteer just in the last couple of years having a look about and I will say that Ann Redra is hard to find and it's unbelievable when you consider the numbers of it. How many of the species that we're looking at in here have just done regenerated naturally? Most everything has, okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah, most everything you're looking at is natural regeneration, okay? So there, yeah. there, there was a seed bank here then? No, not a seed bank. It's the trees fruiting at the time. Drops the, the birds and whatever vectors that are doing it, so they are dropping them on there and they're growing from there. Okay, the seed bank does apply to things like giant seeing trees. Some of the smaller, smaller seeds of some of those uh, uh, early successional species are long lived. Okay, but by and large, it's, it's stuff that's happening from the trees that were here or from outside in the landscape. So there was enough diversity in the things that yeah. had survived down to that Yes, yes, and, and elsewhere. And that was again, Floyd said, pecking around on the ground, and this is where he was on him, he said, look, if you don't get there and get those trees while you can and save them, you're going to drop the whole thing out. The rainforest ecologists were unanimous in supporting a dynamic, fast-moving change with the herbicide behind us. You can look at this reserve as a genetic pool, but if you look at the Manning Valley on the floodplain, then you yep. can see each of those small reserves as part of that pool mm -hmm. that you can, even though they've got their differences, mm -hmm. you can maybe potentially link them under the genetic biodiversity sort of laws and rules that mm -hmm. persist these days. So it's not just working on this reserve, it's knowing all our reserves in this area. I mean, John and I had a dream years ago of a rainforest um, ribbon all the way from Wing, mm. all the way down to Tari, which would have existed years ago, linking yeah. Kukenback yeah. Island with this. Yeah. There are remnants on the way down, but you know, it was a dream at the time and it's still a dream. Yes, it's still a dream. But it still could be a possibility one day in terms of um, regenerating land that's just not being used these days. Yeah. Lots on private property. Yeah. So mm. many little gullies on private mm. property that mm. no one really knows what's there. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Yeah. But that's right. But it's very important to keep that in mind, I think. Even if there's, you don't see a rainforest around, doesn't mean there aren't a range of rainforest trees producing seeds yeah. in other communities. Yeah. And the bats, of course. Yeah. Oh. And the birds. Mm -hmm. Bring it around. The dispersal of rainforest species is indeed intertwined with the bats. 
fruit bats known as flying foxes. There are now three species in Wingham Brush. The grey-headed flying fox, little red flying fox and the black flying fox. They're a keystone species, sustaining native ecosystems along Australia's east coast. Their services include plant pollination, long-distance seed transport and nutrient distribution. The animals and plants depend on each other, but grey-headed flying fox numbers across the landscape have plummeted in recent years and they're threatened with extinction, mainly due to habitat destruction and now climate change. These are grey-headed flying fox, which are, you know, a listed species, okay? Listed as uh, vulnerable. Um, and it, at times we have, we've had numbers here that are so great that they've represented half of the known numbers of this species in the world. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, here in the brush. Okay, we've had numbers that are that high. Well, it would have been about 18 months ago we had a really severe heat wave. Yep. And there was, it got to almost 50 degrees at Port Macquarie and it was well over 40 degrees here and they were just falling out of the trees. Mm -hmm. And we found them just crisp hanging on the branches. Dead. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yep. And, and you're quite, quite right, when you get, you get, into, the, you get into the 40s, um, you get tremendous mortalities. Well, I've seen the whole floor of the brush covered in dead bats. A variety of ongoing threats keep the brush in a precarious position. Responsive intervention from skilled bush regenerators is still required to sustain it, and probably always will be in this altered landscape. Extensive damage from severe flooding in 2021 is one example. Vast amounts of soil and weed were dumped in the reserve and another labour-intensive rescue effort was needed. But the fact that we can walk into Wingham Brush today and sense the grandeur and complexity of this ancient ecosystem shows that the restoration was a huge success. The almost dead rainforest remnant was given a new life and the project provides resounding lessons for ecological restoration across the globe. Really, it was, it was the lost cause. But it's only through community and the efforts of John and the team that it's got to this point. The National Parks came back into the scene. Oh, we can make this a nature reserve. You've done such a good job. We've basically created a nature reserve. You know, in terms of local support, one thing that I'd say that's been a huge change is in, instead of every time flying foxes were here, uh, having letters to the press all the time, uh, complaining about that, we just don't see that anymore and there is a general recognition that, that the flying foxes are a tourist attraction. And it's taken a long time to get to that.